2.30. Just let me know when they get here. Okay. Okay. All right. I'll try to find it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Oh, yeah. So I um, will, or either on the D page, but I'll look for it. Hmm? Oh, okay. Thanks. All right, if everyone will have a seat, I'm going to call the docket. All right, so this is the order of things this morning. Uh, I'm going to call the docket. Then at 930, we have a jury coming back for closing arguments. No one is excused unless I excuse you. Uh, when I call your name, please stand and let me know you're here. If you don't let me know you're here, I'm going to assume you're not and a warrant may be issued for your arrest. If you are on the front row, that means that you were late for court today. If you're on the front row, that means that you're late for court today. So no one on that front row but late people. People still sit there. When I say if you're on that road, that means you were late. All right. Jose Angel Torres. Thank you. Stephanie Clyde or Cled. In custody is Jonathan Allen, Pete Castillo, Juan Arojo, Abel Rodriguez, Mary Diaz. And I think she's excused from appearance. Isaiah Verjou. Thank you. In custody is Dominique Nicholson, Andrew Arnett, Andrew Arnett. Council's present. Robert Earl Grant, Robert Grant. Where? Here. Thank you. Rosalinda Contreras. Here. Renee Esparza. Here. Thank you. Michelle Esquivel. Michelle Esquivel, David Gerwitz, thank you. Jorge Sandoval, custody. Marciano Green, custody. Jesus Prado, custody. Alfred Flores, thank you. Thank you. How do you pronounce that, Alazar? Alazar Alejandro. Thank you. Thank you. Nathaniel Villalobos. Thank you. Uh, Greg Wright is in custody. Antonio Rios. Antonio Rios. Katrina Ruiz. All right. You're supposed to be in impact court. Uh, that's on the second floor. Car uh, they're going to be waiting for you in impact court. Second floor. Katrina Ruiz, you're scheduled for jury trial in impact court. It's on the second floor. Judge, I think um, Mr. Varju is as well. Uh, Varju, impact court, second floor. Thank you. And if they say you're late, just let them know you were here. You. Carlos Terrazas, custody. Joshane Caldwell, Joshane Caldwell. Patrick Jenkins, George Hawkins. All right, thank you. Joseph Grosso. Thank you. Adrian Delatiro, custody. Ernest Mora. Ernest Mora. Jorge Sandoval. All right, is there anyone who came in late or your name was not called? These are the rules of the court. 
First row, sir. What is your name? Adrian, what? All right, just have a seat. We'll get with you. All right, these are the rules. Criminal trial division files are over here. Family violence files are over here. Do not approach the court unless you confer with the state and confer with your client. As your, if your client is in custody, once you request them, do not leave the courtroom because for security reasons, there are only a limited number of inmates who are allowed out at the same time. Where Deputy Mejia is standing, that's where the inmates come from. Do not block that entryway. Do not block their line of sight. At the back, you have probation. Probation, could you raise your hand? Do not turn your back to her. Do not sit on her desk. Do not put your papers on her desk. That's her desk. That's her office without walls. To my left is the court reporter. Do not put your papers on top of her desk. Do not lean on her desk. Her equipment costs over $10,000. If you destroy it or damage it, you will have bought it. Do not approach the clerk or the coordinator while we are on the record. If you are entering a plea, all your paperwork must be in by 1115. If it is not in by 1115, then you will be brought back. All right. If your client wishes to speak to the court in a language other than English, you will need an interpreter, whether you speak their language or not. Once you request an interpreter, do not leave the courtroom because there is a shortage of interpreters. All right, everyone. Today is Monday. It's going to be a good day. So confer with a smile on your face. And again, we're starting up with the jury trial at 930, and that's for closing arguments. Everyone, please confer. Chris Rosa. Okay, so you think it's eight, nine? Okay. I'll find it right now and take care of it. Okay. You should have what? Okay, that's what I was wondering because I can't see it on the system. And then it shows she's on bond on the other case. She has a second case. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Grosso, no. what are you doing? Hello. Is that Grosso? No, no, no. No, no, Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. For Mr. Groff, so this is the one that we're waiting to talk about this evaluation. Okay. Let me see. I do understand that he had a meeting. Okay. So where is he? Oh, have him come up, please. Let's see. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Hello, Mr. Grosso. Hi, how are you doing this morning? All right. So what we're going to do is I'm going to reset you, okay? Because my understanding, you still need to speak to someone. So I'm going to give you a, a different court date. And counsel, I'm going to set it for, I'm going to set it for April 1st. And if something comes up sooner than then, we'll do it sooner. So let me give you your reset form. And then once he signs it, you all excuse. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, yes, I will. If you'll have them print a B page and I'll ask that that be waived. Okay. Okay. Whoa, that's loud. I thought this was expensive equipment. That's 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 Hank. <laughs> That'll be under today. Yes, that's loud. Because I think it's because people are stepping on things or something. Thank you, Diana. Yeah, I sent them an email. We're missing some discovery. They haven't made an offer yet. I'll tell you something. Well, I appreciate it. Thanks for letting me know the feedback there. You know, Andrew, are Annette everybody. I think she's traveling. Morning, Your Honor. Good morning. Yeah, well, I appreciate you saying that. It's actually been really wonderful work for you. Yes, sir. I appreciate it. All right, counsel, I know you've just recently been appointed. That's correct, Your Honor. And I was looking into one matter last time we got that question resolved, I believe. Mm -hmm. But I do need one more reset before we can uh, be ready to go. Okay. Let me look here. Uh, February 8th, is that enough time? Check room. And it will be your, it, it's for the plea deadline date. If I'm not in trial, February 8th is fine. All right, February 8th is going to be your plea deadline date, Mr. Arnett, and you need to make sure that you're on time for court. You understand? Yes? Okay. All right, once you sign the reset form, you're excused. All right, let's have a season. I'll get it to you in a second.
Rosalinda Contreras. Who's the attorney for Rosalinda Contreras? I'm just... All right. Hi. How are you? Oh, I'm doing fine. All right. All right. So uh, you've hired an attorney, correct? Yes. Okay. And you filed a notice? I have, Judge. All right. So where are we on discovery? Um, I'm missing some discovery, which is not a surprise on this first setting. I've sent an email to Hank about it, and I've asked for an offer. So we're just going to wait and see about that. All right. So what discovery are you missing? I am missing the, I believe, the IDR, at least one Coban. And I don't know off the top of my head, but I took an inventory of it. Okay. All right. I'm going to recall this for February 26th, and that will be for discovery. And if um, Ms. Warburton is going to file a rep with blood, we need, does she file that today, Judge? Yes. Oh, yes. I will file that when I get back to my office. Thank you for reminding me, Hank. Um, instead of the 26th, Judge, could it be the 29th? I have a doctor's appointment on the 26th and the 27th and the 28th. All right. We'll put it for the 29th. Thank you, Judge. All right, once you sign the reset form, you are excused. Thank you, Jen. You're Thank welcome. You. Yes. Uh, my understanding is she has a warrant she has an MCR. She has a period that I included. All right. So let me uh on Stephanie Cleed, that's on page 23. Has a warrant been issued on this case for her? Yes, JT is a few All right. Could I see that uh file, please? And then you're excused. Thank you. If she shows, we'll give you a call. All right, and that one's done. Hi. Okay. Uh, I think this is the one we, we already did. Let me double check. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, the parties on John Stephen Meyer, if y'all could come forward just briefly, please. No, it's not on the record. I printed it. It's come around. <laughs> it's come around. <laughs> All right, the clerk printed that off. And for her, she says revised, but I think that's the same one that we did before we left last night. So if y'all can check and just make sure. Okay. All right, thanks. But I think it's the same. If you guys are step step back for a moment. Oh, yeah, that's okay. Who's here on Jonathan Allen? Jonathan Kane Allen? And where is Judge? I, I wanted to report uh, the recommendation for this case by the state. This is an MTR this morning. 
mm -hmm. is for DDRF. Um, however, he's got an appointment with Seneca Healthcare Services on the first, which is okay. Thursday. Um, and, uh, and it's basically to reassess whether or not DDRF is even going to be a possibility. Well, it's got pretty severe schizophrenia. He's mm -hmm. been off his meds and not doing well. And so. Probation. Yes, sir. Are you okay with resetting? Yes. Just thought we'd kind of hang with one full swoop rather than coming back. All right. So uh, probation, when should we come back on this? The following week or no? Yes. All right. So then we'll call this back on February 5th. And let me give you a reset form for your client. And then once your uh, client signs it, you're all excused. Oh, he's in custody. He's in custody. He's on the way out. I'm going to talk to him anyway. All right. Anyway. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. That one's done. Well, these are the rules. If you all want to approach, y'all need to have conferred with your client and ask the clerk to grab the file. The clerk will place the file here. I will call you in the order of appearance. <laughs> How are you? Yeah. Uh, on the 26th, it looks like Friday, a uh, motion to modify bond conditions. Is that what it is? If you give me a second, I'll go print it out. Thank you so much. I'm going to print a motion out for one of those cases. All right. Which one is it for? The Alamos. All right. Alfred Flores. All right. So where are we on discovery? Your Honor, as regards Mr. Flores' case, um, I believe all discovery that the state is aware of is uploaded into his file for the evidence repository. I have also, as there are co-defendants in this matter, I have also, there's a discrepancy between uh, what Mr. Flores has available and his two co-defendants. I've already brought that up to counsel. We are working on a solution to it where I will personally give everyone everything by copying uh, what I've downloaded and been working with to date. And once one uh, firm has provided me a hard disk to provide a copy, the other one will get me one today, and we will make that available to all parties equally uh, by the end of the week. All right. Your reset date for discovery is going to be February 26th. At that time, all discovery needs to be in. One other issue that we're still, the state is still working on, Your Honor, the, the deceased complainant in this matter uh, had a uh, treatment period at Starlight Recovery in Kirby. Mm -hmm. I've made efforts to obtain those documents. They are now bumping me back as a federal HIPAA violation. I anticipate it's taking the state some time to work through that. I don't, I'm not saying I won't have it by the February 26th date, but I am attempting to bring it to the court's attention. Uh, we expect the deceased uh, mindset to be an issue of trial. And so that is why we're trying to proceed aggressively to get those documents from the treatment facility. All right, so they've been subpoenaed? Yes, ma'am. Okay. They have, we're rebutting the subpoena, so we're trying to work it out. All right, anything else other than the complainant's medical records? 
Um, Judge, from the defense, just for the court's consideration on the given February date, we're going to work um, within those parameters. Uh, but there's the possibility that it might not be complete by then. Between the last discovery volley and this one, it's gone from 800 items to 1,394. So to be able to appropriately review all these things and decide what is or isn't missing still, it's going to take a considerable amount of time. And are you the only attorney who knows that it's 1,394? Will the other attorneys know that as well? They will know that number as well. Okay. It's 1,394. <laughs> uh, actually, 1,377. But Defendant Flores is the one that is, got that matter. The other two have somewhat lesser amounts, which is why I'm going to equalize it to all. Yeah. All right. So you're telling me that everybody is going to have everyone's discovery. Yes, ma'am. All right, we'll come back on February 26th. That'll be discovery at 9 a.m. Once you sign the reset form, you are excused. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. You're Elazar Alejandro. Hello. So I'm hello. So I'm assuming the discovery is the same. Uh, in uh, defendant Alejandro's case, he's missing one PDF document. Again, that's what I'm going to equalize. All right, we're going to come back on February 26th for discovery. Once you sign the reset form, you're excused. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Nathaniel Villalobos. All right, where are we on discovery? It's the same issue, George. Okay. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, defendant Villalobos, for whatever the reason, is off by over 100 PDF documents. And that, when I noticed it, uh, coordinated with all counsel by email, that's why I'm going to equalize uh, across all three. All right, your reset date for discovery is going to be the 26th. And we'll see where we are. Yes, Judge. And there's one other matter. I've conferred with counsel with the state. Mm -hmm. There's a motion to amend bond conditions for Mr. Villalobos to travel to get some diagnostic testing from an accident he had prior to this incident when he was on duty. All right. Just give me one moment. Let me write this down and then we'll take that up. Sure. All right, and we're going to go on the record. Court is calling 2023 CR11510C, State of Texas versus Nathaniel Villalobos. Could I have parties announced for the record for the state? Daryl Harris for the state yard. Defense? Nico LaHood from Mr. Villalobos, Jeff. All right, uh, the court has a motion to temporarily amend uh, conditions of bond. State, have you had a chance to review the document? 
Uh, just glanced at a hard copy of the hallway judge. It appears to be in order uh, based on the requirement for medical testing. Uh, the state has no objection to that, to that basis. All right. All right, then your motion will be granted. Thank you, Judge. You're welcome. Is there anything else? No, Your Honor. All right, once you sign the reset form, you're excused. If you want a copy of this, uh, the clerk will be able to get it for you at the back. Thank you, Your Honor. You're welcome. Thank you. Maybe excuse you. Yes. All right. All right. Defense, did you have a chance to review the jury charge that I gave you? Is that the same? I have, and so has uh, Mr. Wilkins for the state. There is one problem we have. Uh, do we have approach? Yes. On Friday, mm -hmm. this is the new charge. All right, what page? Two. You can uh, correctly limit you. Uh, they're under Arabic three. The definitions. Of oh, you know, know what? This is the wrong one then. This is the correct one that I have. So if you. <laughs> no, no, no. Because, you know, the clerk sent that, brought that out to me. But then that's the correct one because I had printed it off last night before we left. But when she brought that out, I said, uh, could this be the one? So we're going to dump that one. Okay. And that's the correct one. All right. So we're going to put the, the, that there's no objection to the charge on the record. Judge, I, I do have one special request for the jury instruction. It's along the lines of what we've seen on the district court over the weekend. Okay. All right. And we can hear that. Uh, Diana, we're going to go on the record. Oh, you guys can step back. And then once we put this on the record, you, you can go ahead and line the jurors up. Court is calling 2024 CR0170, State of Texas versus John Stephen Meyer. Could I have parties announced for the record for the state? Hank Wilkins and Kevin Stone for the state, Your Honor. Defense? Uh, Charlie Baird and Mark Stevens for John Meyer. And are you Mr. Meyer? Yes, sir. All right. So I believe it was Friday. We had a conference on the charge of court. Defense, you are requesting a specific instruction? Yes, Your Honor. I submitted it. I don't think I've given Mr. Wilkins a copy yet. Uh, I'll tell you, Judge. That there is a case that could hardly be more squarely against me on this. Okay. But I think it's wrong. And uh, Ms. Paulison mentioned another case, but there is a case that's against us. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the case is wrong. And the case I'm talking about is De La Torre, D E yes. L A T O R R E. Uh, and it was. Uh, it overruled a case called McShane, M-C-S-H-A-N-E. So we think McShane should not have been overruled. It should be the law. It's not right now, but just in case it ever is again, we want to make a record on that. Too. All right. I appreciate that. Uh, the motion will be uh, denied. All right. Other than that request, any other objections to the jury charge? Can we have a chance to have no other objections, Your Honor? All right. All right. So the jury is lined up outside. I know there are two exhibits that are going to be admitted. So do you all have the two exhibits? All right. So what we'll do is when the jury comes in, uh, I will just say, so it won't be anyone's fault. I'll just say uh, the court is allowing both sides to reopen their cases and then state, if you have no evidence to submit, you can just say, we'll rest. And then defense, you can admit your exhibits. Thank you. All right. And then, Your Honor, can I say this? Uh, I, I expect we will rest immediately thereafter, and then we would like to make a motion with the court outside the jury's presence. I hate to just be in and out like that. But, uh, OK. Well, yeah. let's do this. Technically, you all both have rested and closed. So if you want to make your argument outside the jury's presence, now you can do it. And then I'll allow you to reopen. And if I'm wrong, let me know I'm wrong. I'm thinking the evidence that you're offering in 
it's probably been admitted through testimony, just not the, the photo. It's a different, it's slightly different, Judge. Yes. But, and I'm going to need the help of uh, Mr. Wilkins on this too, because he has spoken to it earlier, and I'd like him to uh, make that statement again on the record. Also, Judge, we do do want to make a bill of exception mm -hmm. uh, to the uh, uh, the court will remember that the state made a motion in limine to exclude uh, any evidence or admission or discussion of uh, disposition of Melissa Giannis's case. Yes. Uh, we think that, um, may I make that right now, Judge? Well, the jury's in the hallway. Are you okay with making that after closing? If the court, let me just make sure. I know there may be some rules against that, but I haven't read any. You know what? I'll go ahead and let you do it now because I haven't read case law that says I can give you leave to do it yeah, I'm beforehand. I'm not doing it later, Judge. I'll, I'll try to move quickly. Okay. Uh, the court will remember that Melissa Yanez was arrested and jailed for possession of approximately 300 grams of methamphetamine on August the 8th around 2.30 in the afternoon, and that she was trailed, according to the testimony, directly from the residence of 224 Majestic Grove to uh, a place a few minutes away where a traffic stop was uh, engaged, and that uh, over our objection, and, and in that video, the, uh, well, over our objection, the defense was allowed, excuse me, the state was allowed to play a muted video, just show the video uh, showing the traffic stop and the search of her vehicle uh, and the discovery of the methamphetamine, the alleged methamphetamine in her purse. Uh, we objected to that as irrelevant and violative of Rule 403 but our objections were overruled. Uh, so, uh, Your Honor, additionally, during the trial, the state offered the search warrant, which, and the affidavit, both of which alleged that Melissa Yanez was in control and charge of the premises at 224 Majestic Grove. We objected to the admission of that warrant as hearsay, among other things. The court overruled that objection. So it's our petition at, position at this time, Your Honor, that it's highly relevant that no charges. And I'd like to, I'd like Mr. Wilkins to confirm uh, what he said the other day. Still, no charges have been filed by the Bear County District Attorney's Office uh, involving the arrest on August the eighth of Melissa Giannis. Is, is that still true, Mr. Young? Mr. Wilkins? You know, uh, I don't know that they are. I can check right now. And while he's checking, Your Honor, because uh, I, I believe it's still to be true, uh, our position is is that now the fact that no charges have been filed against her, but they have against John Meyer, uh, would be highly relevant, we believe, for the jury to say, why not? So it's uh, the, that we cannot get into this, uh, we think, impairs our right to present a defense for Mr. Meyer under the 6th and 14th Amendments to the United States Constitution and Article 1, Section 10 of the Texas Constitution. Additionally, Your Honor, under Rule 107 of the Texas Rules of Evidence, uh, the optional completeness rule, uh, which, which says that when one party has uh, introduced an act or a declaration or a recording, uh, the other side is entitled, the adverse party, that would be us, is entitled under Rule 107 to offer evidence uh, that is is uh, relates to that same event, and additionally to offer evidence that is necessary to explain that event. We think that uh, the evidence we would offer that uh, no charges have yet been filed against Ms. Yonis, and is that still true, Mr. Wilkins? Yes, sir. Yeah. So, Judge, I just checked on the JD system. That's still a waiting indictment. So. Um, I would say the charges are still pending against Ms. Connors, even though they haven't been filed yet. That's the way I would characterize it. And, and the court would note that our indictment originally was filed, I believe, in October of 2022 against Mr. Meyer. 
and uh, re-indicted the same offense, was re-indicted recently, but we think that the state has had more than enough time, given the evidence on that video and the quantity of drugs, to indict Ms. Yanez uh, and bring her to court, just like they have brought Mr. Meyer to court. Okay. All right, and um, correct me if I'm wrong, nobody called Ms. Yanez as a witness, is that correct? No, I mean, she wasn't called as a witness. I, I would also say these are completely different cases. This is a traffic stop. I, I oh, no, know. he's just making a bill. I just wanted to to be clear that no one has been called. Ms. Yanez yes, was not called as a witness. Yes. All right. All right, is there anything else? We would simply say that because they are completely different cases, that was why it should have never come in front of the jury to begin with. Okay, all right. Now, since both of you all have rested and closed, I believe you said you had a motion, Mr. Stevens? Yes, Your Honor, motion for instructive verdict. Uh, as the court well knows, there's a abundant case law that says in Texas and has said for a long time that mere presence at the scene where drugs are found uh, is not sufficient by itself to prove uh, that a person at that location possessed those drugs. There has to be something more than mere presence alone that links the person to the drugs. In our case, on both counts, there is just simply no evidence whatsoever that John Meyer uh, had exercised care, control, custody, or management over either the methamphetamine charged in count one or the morphine charged in count two. Uh, and Absent that evidence, uh, we think that the, uh, the proper ruling in this case would be to grant our motion for instructive verdict of not guilty on both counts one and two because the evidence is legally insufficient in violation of the due process clause of the United States Constitution. Your Honor, this is a very low burden. We just need to meet a scintilla of evidence. I, I feel like we far exceeded that. Um, in this case, so we do oppose the, the defense's motion. All right, defense's motion will be denied. Your Honor, can I say this just in addition, on top of what I just made, the argument for count one, the methamphetamine, the evidence is even more flagrantly insufficient because of the morphine for this reason. There is, as the court will know, on that exhibit, and I forget what the exhibit for uh, the, the bottle of morphine, but it is in evidence. And the court will note that there is a name on that prescription, a person named Kathleen London, L-O-N-D-O-N, -O -O was prescribed that, that medication. And the prescription is dated uh, June, I believe it's June 9th of, I know the year is 2015. The prescription is for 30 pills. And by testimony, there are 22 pills left in the bottle. We would say that the evidence is, is entirely uh, unconnected and unlinked to John Meyer, not only by uh, no affirmative link other than mere presence, but also by uh, the, the name uh, and the date on the prescription. All right, uh, defense motion will be denied. My understanding the, the jurors are ready? They're ready, Judge. So we'll bring them in and then state, you'll just ask to reopen. Yes. Thank you. Oh, uh, are you going to be walking here? I'm doing a little wandering. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Deputy yeah. Laura's like, no. I'm, I'm being, being very careful. Okay. Hey, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. But, um, since we're opening up, I got just no more. Nothing further from the state. Is that no, it? no, you just asked to reopen. The defense will open. And if there's no objection, I'll just tell the jurors that both parties have requested to reopen to produce or submit evidence. And then you all can submit what you want to submit. Okay, thank you, Jill. All right, let's bring them in. All right, for the jury. We're good. I have to sign the orders that you've given me, so I'm working on something. All right, everyone, please be seated. Happy Monday.
right. Uh, both the state and defense are, are requesting to reopen. Uh, state. Do you rest? Yes, ma'am. Defense. Judge, at this time, the defense will offer defendants exhibits 10 and 25. Any objection? No objection, Your Honor. All right. Defense exhibit 10 and 25 are admitted without objection. And upon their admission, Judge, now the defense rests. Okay. State, do you close? We close, Your Honor. Defense, do you close? Yes, ma'am. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to read to you the charge of the court. After I read the charge of the court, uh, both parties will have a chance to uh, present argument to you if they so choose. You do not have to memorize what I'm reading to you because this will be sent back with you. Charge of the court. Members of the jury, the defendant John Stephen Meyer stands charged in count one of the indictment with the offense of possession of a controlled substance, namely methamphetamine, which by aggregate weight, including any adulterants or dilutants, was of an amount four grams or more, but less than 200 grams, alleged to have been committed on or about the eighth day of August 2022 in Bear County, Texas. The defendant, John Stephen Meyer, stands charged in count two of the indictment with the offense of possession of a controlled substance, namely morphine, which by aggregate weight, including any adulterants or dilutants, was of an amount one gram or more, but less than four grams alleged to have been committed on or about the eighth day of August, 2022 in Bear County, Texas. To these offenses, the defendant has pleaded not guilty. One, our law provides that a person commits an offense if he knowingly or intentionally possesses a controlled substance. Methamphetamine is a controlled substance. Morphine is a controlled substance. Two, by the term possession is meant actual care, custody, control, or management of the controlled substance. Adulterant or dilutant means any material that increases the bulk or quantity of a controlled substance, regardless of its effect on the chemical activity of the controlled substance. Three, a person acts intentionally or with intent with respect to the nature of his conduct when it is his conscious objective or desire to engage in the conduct. A person acts knowingly or with knowledge with respect to the nature of his conduct when he is aware of the nature of his conduct. Four, you are instructed that a person commits an offense only if he voluntarily engages in conduct, including an act, an omission, or possession. Possession is a voluntary act if the possessor knowingly obtains or receives the thing possessed or is aware of his control of the thing for a sufficient time to permit him to terminate his control. Five, count one. Now, if you unanimously find from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that on or about the eighth day of August, 2022 in Bear County, Texas, the defendant, John Stephen Meyer, did intentionally or knowingly possess a controlled substance, namely methamphetamine, which by aggregate weight, including any adulterants or dilutants, was of an amount four grams or more, but less than 200 grams, then you will find the defendant guilty of the offense of possession of a controlled substance, namely methamphetamine, which by aggregate weight, including any adulterants or dilutants, was of an amount four grams or more, but less than 200 grams as charged in count one of the indictment. If you do not so find beyond a reasonable doubt, or if you have a reasonable doubt thereof, you will find the defendant not guilty of count one. Number six, count two. Now, if you unanimously find from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that on or about the 8th day of August 2022 in Bear County, Texas, the defendant, John Stephen Meyer, did intentionally or knowingly possess a controlled substance, namely morphine, which by aggregate weight, including any adulterants or dilutants, was of an amount one gram or more, but just one moment, one gram or more but less than four grams, then you will find the defendant guilty of the offense of possession of a controlled substance, namely morphine, which by aggregate weight, including any adulterants or dilutants, was of an amount one gram or more, but less than four grams as charged in count two of the indictment. If you do not so find beyond a reasonable doubt, or if you have a reasonable doubt there, you will find the defendant not guilty of count two. Seven, in this case, the defendant has elected not to testify. And you are instructed that you cannot and must not refer or allude to that fact throughout your deliberations or take it into consideration for any purpose whatsoever as a circumstance against him. Eight, you are instructed that you must not communicate with or provide any information to anyone 
or receive any information from anyone by any means about this case. You may not use any electronic device or media such as telephone, cell phone, smartphone, iPhone, Blackberry, iPad, tablet, or computer, the internet, any internet service or any text or instant messaging service or any social media platform, internet chat room, blog, or website to include, but not limited to Facebook, MySpace, Instagram, Snapchat, LinkedIn, YouTube, TikTok, Twitter, or X to communicate with anyone, any information, or receive any information from anyone about this case or to conduct any research about this case until I accept your verdict. Written statements made by a witness to investigators or other officers or police reports made by officers and tendered by the prosecution to the defense for purposes of cross-examination are not part of the evidence unless introduced in evidence. Many times statements and reports may be marked with an exhibit number, but are neither offered nor received in evidence. I can send only statements and reports received in evidence to the jury room. You're instructed that the statements of counsel made during the course of the trial or during the argument, if not supported by evidence or statements of law made by counsel, if not in harmony with the law as stated to you by the court in these instructions are to be wholly disregarded. You must disregard any comment or statement made by the court during the trial or in these instructions, which may seem to indicate an opinion with respect to any fact, item of evidence or verdict to be reached in this case. No such indication is intended. You are instructed that the grand jury indictment is not evidence of guilt. It is the means whereby a defendant is brought to trial in a felony prosecution. It is not evidence, nor can it be considered by you in passing upon whether this defendant is guilty or not guilty. During your deliberations in this case, you must not consider, discuss, nor relate any matters not in evidence before you. You should not consider nor mention any personal knowledge or information you may have about any fact or person connected with this case, which is not shown by the evidence. You are instructed that you are not to let bias, prejudice, or sympathy play any part in reaching a verdict in this case. After argument of counsel, you will retire to the jury room, select your own presiding juror, and proceed with your deliberations. After you have reached a unanimous verdict, the presiding juror was certified thereto by filling in the appropriate forms attached to this charge and signing his or her name as presiding juror. You are the exclusive judges of the facts proved, of the credibility of the witnesses, and of the weight to be given to the testimony, but you are bound to receive the law from the court, which is hearing given to you, and be governed by that law. In order to return a verdict, each juror must agree to that verdict but jurors have a duty to consult each other and to deliberate with a view to reaching unanimous agreement if that can be done without violence to individual judgment. A unanimous vote means all 12 jurors must agree. Each juror must decide the case for himself, but only after an impartial consideration of the evidence with fellow jurors. Everyone, please make sure your phones are on silent or either off. In the course of deliberations, a juror should not hesitate to re-examine his own views and change his opinion if convinced it is erroneous. However, no juror should surrender his honest conviction as to the weight or effect of the evidence solely because of the opinion of his fellow jurors or for the mere purpose of returning a verdict. All persons are presumed to be innocent and no person may be convicted of an offense unless each element of the offense is proved beyond a reasonable doubt. The fact that a person has been arrested, confined, or indicted for, or otherwise charged with the offense gives rise to no inference of guilt at his trial. The law does not require a defendant to prove his innocence or produce any evidence at all. The presumption of innocence alone is sufficient to acquit the defendant unless the jurors are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt of the defendant's guilt after careful and impartial consideration of all the evidence in the case. The prosecution has the burden of proving the defendant guilty, and it must do so by proving each and every element of the offense charge beyond a reasonable doubt, and if it fails to do so, you must acquit the defendant. It is not required that the prosecution prove guilt beyond all possible doubt. It is required that the prosecution's proof excludes all reasonable doubt concerning the defendant's guilt. In the event you have a reasonable doubt as to the defendant's guilt after considering all the evidence before you and these instructions, you will acquit him and say by your verdict, not guilty. 
Suitable forms for your verdict are attached to the charge for your convenience if you care to use them, but they are not intended to suggest to you in any way what your verdict should be, and you may or may not, as you see fit, make use of them. At any rate, your verdict must be in writing and signed by your presiding juror. Your only duty at this time is to determine whether the defendant is guilty on the indictment in this cause, and you must restrict your deliberations to the issue of whether the defendant is guilty or not guilty and nothing else. After you have retired to the jury room, no one has any authority to communicate with you except the officer who has you in charge. Do not attempt to talk to the officer or anyone else concerning any questions you may have. Instead, address your question to the court in writing. If you wanna communicate with the court, notify the bailiff. Any and all communication relative to the case must be written, prepared by the presiding juror, and submitted to the court through the bailiff. Respectfully submitted, Judge Stephanie Boyd, 187 District Court, Bear County. Suitable forms are attached. State, are you prepared to proceed with argument? Our time, All right, defense, are you prepared? I am, Judge. All right, defense, you may proceed. Thank you. And uh, I think they're gonna assist me with some PowerPoint. Sure, I'll start your time once it's, the PowerPoint is up. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Morning. It's been a while since we've had a chance to visit with you as a group like this. I guess it was last Monday. And I wanted to visit with you today about what I believe the evidence has shown or not shown as you begin your deliberations in this case. Right? Uh, what I would like to do is um, go back and talk about some of the time we spent together last Monday, some of the subjects that we covered, and talk to you about some of the promises that y'all made. We talked and said that you had to truthfully answer all the questions that we ask of you, that you had to give only honest answers, and that you must keep any promises that you had made. We all agreed that you would do that. We talked about the presumption of innocence and how that is a fundamental part of every trial, that you view the testimony through the lens that the accused person has done nothing wrong. The presumption of innocence we talked about we said it is what keeps, causes you to have an open mind and it forces you to be fair. And then I asked you about the old expression about giving somebody the benefit of the doubt. And I said, I think that's what the presumption of innocence encompasses. And I said, would you all give John Meyer the benefit of the doubt? And you said that you would. I talked to you about that in relation to the instructions that Judge Boyd would give you. And Judge Boyd has read this document to you. You will have the copy to go back there with you. And I will, if you have any questions about what she said or what I've said, please go back and refresh this because this is kind of like the instruction book when you're uh, called to assemble something. And part of the assembly here, of course, is the presumption of innocence. And Judge Boyd tells you on page 9 of 13, all persons are presumed innocent. And the presumption of innocence alone is sufficient to acquit, which means return a verdict of not guilty. We talked to you about the burden of proof. And Judge Boy, I told you that Judge Boy would instruct you, and sure enough, she has on page 10. She instructs you that the prosecution has the burden of proving the defendant guilty, and it must do so by proving each and every element of the offense charged beyond a reasonable doubt. And if it fails to do so, you must acquit. And I brought to your attention a couple of things that were underlined there. Number one is that you have each and every element has to be proven, not just some, but all of them. And that at the end, if the state has failed to do that beyond a reasonable doubt, you must acquit. Doesn't say can, doesn't say may. It says you must acquit. You have no choice there. We talked about the individual elements of each case. And we went through this, and the state and I agreed that the elements are the same as it relates to counts one and counts two. 
And I submit to you that the only elements that are in dispute here are whether or not John Meyer intentionally and knowingly possessed either methamphetamine or coca or uh, uh, morphine, morphine, excuse me. We talked about reasonable doubt, the state's burden of proof. And if they don't convince you beyond a reasonable doubt, if you're not certain beyond a reasonable doubt, then your verdict is not guilty. And I ask you if you could still presume John Meyer innocent, even though there were two counts of the indictment. And you said yes. And of, of your number to begin with, last Monday, a number of people said no. If he's been charged with two different counts, I can't presume him innocent. None of y'all said that. In fact, we talked about the presumption of innocence so much, I was going over it, and I went back to my notes, and I think it was Miss Webster said, uh, innocent unless proven guilty. It doesn't say innocent until. It says innocent unless and that was a very good distinction that she made. He is presumed innocent, and he remains innocent unless the state proves everything beyond a reasonable doubt. And I ask you, would anybody here require John Meyer to prove anything? And you all said that you would not because you recognize the burden in light of a presumption of innocence is on the state. And then we talk about the offenses uh, that are alleged in the indictment. We've got a couple of new words that are on page three. <laughs> One of them deals with voluntariness. It says a person commits an offense only if he voluntarily possesses the drugs. And then we have essentially two different definitions of possession. One of them is voluntary possession. And it says there, possession is voluntary if the possessor knowingly obtains or receives the drug or is aware of his control of the drug for a sufficient time to prevent him to terminate his control. And then this is what we talked about more on Monday. This is on page two. It says possession means actual care, custody, control, or management. And we talked about, it says the state must prove, excuse me, must provide proof the defendant intentionally or knowingly exercised care, custody, control, or management over the drug that John Meyer had actual care, custody, control over the drugs, and if he had possession, he did so intelligently or knowingly. We talked about possession and the fact that a person is at a location where the drugs were discovered does not prove that the person intentionally or knowingly possessed those drugs, and you all agree with that. <clears throat> It was not enough. The defendant was in the vicinity of the drugs. When the accused person is not in exclusive control of the place where the drugs were found, the state must affirmatively link John Meyer to the drugs. We know here there was not exclusive possession of the location there on Majestic Road. So the state must affirmatively link John Meyer to the drugs to your satisfaction, to your certainty beyond a reasonable doubt. And I ask you all, I said, would you convict John Meyer simply because he was at a location where drugs were found and you all promised me said no. We talked about here that you cannot guess and you cannot speculate. And you cannot make up facts to help the jury, excuse me, to help the state. We talked about proof beyond a reasonable doubt, and this is required by our Constitution. It's required in every state in the Union. And it's the highest burden of proof because we're talking about somebody's liberty and their freedom. <laughs> we tend it is not defined in Texas, but we talked about a definition. And it is one that was says that proof of such a convincing character that you would be willing to rely and act upon it without hesitation in the most important of your own affairs. And we talked about how high that burden was and we went over that definition. And I believe that you liked that definition because you thought it made sense. Proof so strong that you would be willing to rely and act upon it without hesitation in the most important of your own affairs. 
We talked about clear and convincing evidence. And we talked about this in the context of child custody cases. And when we talked about it that way, we said this is actually a lower burden of proof than uh, proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And that is evidence that produces in your mind a firm belief about a matter to be true. And because it is a lower burden of proof, you can go back in the jury room and if we sit there and say, it's clear to me and I'm convinced that John Meyer possessed methamphetamine and or morphine. If you say that, and that's as high as it goes, then your burden forevermore is a, ver is a verdict of not guilty. If you say it's clear, I'm convinced he possessed it, your verdict is not guilty because proof beyond a reasonable doubt requires more than clear and convincing evidence. We said the state has the burden of bringing you evidence that you believe beyond a reasonable doubt and a mere possibility or probability is not enough to prove something beyond a reasonable doubt, and you all agree with me. I want to visit with you a little bit now about the evidence. Let's start out, and I'm not good enough with this. I'm afraid I'd stumble around and mess it up. So I'm going to just talk to you about some of these. We start out the surveillance by Rios and Sandoval on a Majestic Road. We've got that. Those are pictures that we brought to you. And we know that they set up surveillance on August the 5th because there has been some type of tip from somebody. We don't know who. We don't know how credible or reliable that person was. But there was foot traffic and vehicular traffic as it relates to this resident, okay. I, Rio says he was there from five o'clock in the morning to two o'clock. Sandoval says that he was there from about five or six until noon. They say the 13 foot track. Now this is a gated community. I doubt that there was any foot traffic whatsoever going up and back and forth to Majestic Road. They also say that they saw some cars coming and going short periods of stay. They don't have a driver's license, they don't have a license plate. They never talked to those people, never wrote down a license plate, nothing, all right? So I don't know what we get out of their being there on August the 5th. August the 6th, Rios was a Saturday. Rios had no investigation at all. August 7th, Rios had no investigation. August the 6th, I believe, uh, Sandoval went by and did a spot check, and that was all. They did not include any foot traffic or vehicular traffic. And I don't think there was anything done on the 7th. There was talk, I believe, through Mr. Stevens' uh, cross-examination of Sandoval that somebody had mentioned the Penske yellow box truck, but that's it. Then they go back on the 8th. And what happens on the 8th? You have Sandoval, Wolf, and um, Rios doing their investigation, their surveillance. Nothing. No foot traffic, no nothing. I think actually Rios said there was some, but Wolf said, I was sitting there in the cul-de-sac and there was zero going on. What does, Rio, what does Wolf see? He sees this lady, Melissa Yanez, leave the residence. He's carrying this purse. She gets in a black Jeep and goes down to the cul-de-sac and turns around and looks into Wolf's vehicle to see if anybody is there. And then she goes back to Majestic Road, goes in the house, comes out, right? And then she drives off. And when she drives off, they begin to tell her. And they have Suarez stop her from a pretext traffic offense for the purpose of investigating whether or not she is dealing with drugs. And you know what we know beyond all doubt? We know that Melissa Yanez is a dedicated stone cold dope dealer, don't we? And she has 370 grams of methamphetamine in her vehicle. 
she has between $3,500 and $4,000 in cash in her vehicle. She has packaging in her vehicle for methamphetamine. We know who she is, and she is in exclusive control of that vehicle, right? So what you have got is a case proven beyond all that I submit to you against Melissa Yanez. But there is no connection by John Meyer with that vehicle. He's not the owner of it. It's not registered to him. He doesn't have a driver's license in there. There's no insurance paperwork in there. There's no mail in there. There's no nothing to indicate or link him to that vehicle. Zero, all right? Zero to link John Meyer with Melissa Yanez. And remember, they took Melissa Yanez's cell phone. And there's not one word that they looked in the cell phone to see if she even had John Meyer's phone number in her cell phone, if there had been any text messages or communications between them whatsoever. You don't have any of that. You don't have any connection between those two individuals. You can't speculate and guess about that. Okay. We also know that shortly after she left, that John Sparks and Elizabeth, Kelly Elizabeth Couples, I think is her name, left in the Penske truck. At this point, nobody even knows that John Meyer is in the house. Right? But they've stopped them and they find drugs on them. Right? No connection with these two. John, there's no connection between John Meyer and the Penske truck whatsoever. You can't guess, you can't speculate, you can't make up facts about that. It is not there in the evidence before you. So what do we know? Based upon that, what happens? Wolf gets a warrant. And in order to get a warrant, he signs an affidavit. And the affidavit says what? It says Melissa Yanez is in Ten charge minutes. of and control of the place of Majestic Grove. She's the one in charge of that place, not John Meyer, Melissa Yanez. And he says that under oath. And then he says further down, there is probable cause to believe that Melissa Yanez possessed drugs in that house, namely methamphetamine, right? Doesn't mention John Meyer. There's probable cause to believe that she possessed the drugs, right? And I'll tell you, we haven't talked about this, but probable cause is a standard much lower than proof of God they need to out. And so then you look at the warrants, and you'll have this to go back there with you. The second paragraph. This is what the judge signs. The judge says, based upon what you're telling me, Detective Wolf, under oath, okay, I'm going to give you permission to search that house, right, which is in control and charge of Melissa Yanez, right? So she's the one. She's the dope dealer. It mentions in here the house is occupied by John Meyer. And we know that. We've never disputed that. We also know that these vehicles were in the residence on Friday, three Gervias, parked at the residence, and they were there on Monday, the 8th, right? We know that. Well, we know what, what else do we know? What's a, lo a logical deduction from that? We know that these individuals belonging to these vehicles are occupying that residence, that's fine. You can occupy it all you want to. It doesn't mean that you possess any controlled substances later found in that residence. They're going to say, well, John Meyer occupied the place. Well, sure he did. He even received mail there. Rio testified to that. We've never disputed that. In fact, it is so little in dispute that we even signed a stipulation of evidence that said we agree that John Meyer gave this address after his arrest it's where he was occupying. But that occupying doesn't mean that you're living, that you are possessing anything necessarily inside there, right? That's what we talked about. So now they go get the warrant and they go into the house and they do the search. And what do we know about the house? We know the house is a stone cold mess, don't we? I mean, this is a construction site and there are lots of pictures of it, but part of the house 
is down to the studs, right? There are major, big toolboxes in the house. There is a table saw inside the house. I mean, it is a mess. And we know, see if I can do this, we know that Mike McKenzie occupies that house. David Aldrete occupies that house. Dorian Sandoval occupies that house. John Sparks occupies that house. Kelly Couples occupies that house. Melissa Yanez has charge and control of the house. John Meyer occupies the house. <laughs> Richard Jarden, we'll talk about that in a second, has drugs there, the prescription drugs, and so does Catherine London. She has, she's the one that has the morphine. So we know that there, I think that there are a total of nine different people associated with that home. How in the world can you say beyond a reasonable doubt of all those nine that John Meyer is the one who possessed the controlled substance intentionally and knowingly had actual terror, custody, control, or management over those substances. You cannot say that beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, once you get inside the house, I've got some more pictures of this as well, but, and I guess you've all seen this enough probably by now, but it's just, it is a construction site. And it is a construction site such that I think that it was uh, Molina, he said, it looked to me like people were inside refurbishing the house and living there at the same time. Five minutes. Thank you. And I submit to you that's what was what they were doing. I want to visit with you about a couple of things. Let's talk about the morphine first. I think the morphine is the easiest, simplest case. And I say that because I think the methamphetamine case is simple as well. But the morphine, nobody knows where that was other than the master bed. It was not seen by Ma and searched it. So perhaps it was in some type of drawer or some closed place. But there's no showing at all that John Meyer ever knew about this or possessed this. And I know you're going to carefully examine all this, but look at this. This was issued on June the 9th of 2015. 2015. Seven years before, right? It expired on June the 9th of 2016. It started out with 30 pills. There's 22 left. I don't know how you prove anybody possessed this on August the 8th, seven years later. But you know, one thing that they didn't do, they didn't call Catherine London and say, are these your drugs? They didn't call the pharmacist. They didn't call the doctor. It's their burden to prove that. So I think the morphine case is easy. Nobody knows who had that, where it was, other than the master bedroom. Now, let me just turn now to the methamphetamine and talk to you about this for a second. You walk into, from the master bedroom to the master bathroom, and there's a vanity on your left and a vanity on your right. The vanity on your right is where they found the methamphetamine, which is 45 feet. That's all we're talking about here in the bathroom. What else did they find? They found bras hanging up in the closet. They found luggage in there as well that I believe the dog alerted on. And I would ask you to do me a favor, please. I don't have time to show you this because I'm going to run out of time. If you would look at Molina's tape at 58 minutes and 10 seconds, when the dog is in the bathroom, Molina says the dog was looking up at me. Molina also said the dog sits or lays down when he alerts. Go back and look at 58 minutes and 10 seconds. What happens is the dog sits down at that piece of luggage and you can see Molina going through it. That is the luggage I submit to you of Yanez, it is her luggage. And I submit to you, if you put all of these pictures together, you 
put all these pictures together, what you're going to find is this is a woman's vanity. There's no proof that John Meyer ever had a clue. Two minutes. Knew, he, he knew or intentionally possessed this controlled substance, methamphetamine, right? It is right there on the vanity. The first thing it is, it's in this bottle, right? And then we know that they take it out of the bottle and there are pictures of it. And we know, I submit to you, that this is a lady's vanity because of the makeup there. And there's also, and there's pictures of this as well, there's also curling out and hair straighteners, I believe, uh, on that vanity. Look at that vanity carefully. There is no shaving cream. There is no men's deodorant. There's nothing of that. Tell me, tell me when there, I've got a minute left, please. One minute. <laughs> All right. It, no one had to that. Let me, let me wrap it up by saying this. When we visited on Monday, we talked about, uh, there was a picture that Mr. Wilkins showed you of a dog. Remember that, Mr. Green, I believe? Was it? And we talked about that. He said, well, do you believe a dog or a raccoon did this? Right? One thing he didn't tell you was that there were eight other dogs in the house. Right? So he said, raccoon or dog, there are eight other people that had access to this place. There's not one shred of evidence that John Meyer was ever in that master bathroom, period. Much less anybody else, excluding anybody else, all right? Now your verdict must be unanimous. And Judge, I'm almost done. Your verdict must be unanimous. The only way you can convict John Meyer is if all of you, all 12 of you agree beyond a reasonable doubt that the state has proven each and every element of its case, unanimous. It is not the same for a verdict of not guilty. And let me tell you what I mean. Let's assume four of you say, I don't think John Myers is guilty because I don't believe they've proven that he possessed the methamphetamine or the morphine. So your vote forevermore is not guilty. Let's say four of you, those the rest of you say, okay, well, I think maybe he possessed it. But the other four say, I don't know that they have proven it beyond a reasonable doubt that he intentionally or knowingly possessed. And those four people say, because they didn't prove the mental state, your verdict forevermore is not guilty. And then let's say the last time you say, well, I think he had possessed it and I think he did it intentionally or knowingly. But you know what? I'm good to clear and convincing, but I'm not certain beyond a reasonable doubt. And if you're not certain beyond a reasonable doubt, then your vote forevermore is not guilty. And so you can you can be unanimous that he's not guilty for different reasons. And I submit to you that there is insufficient proof on any number of reasons Hi. that John Meyer, thank you, Judge, that John Meyer is not guilty. And I respectfully and humbly beseech you to return a verdict of not guilty as it relates to each count of this indictment. Thank you very much. State. Good morning. Thank you all for sticking with us through the week. I know this is maybe taking a little bit longer uh, than we anticipated last week. Uh, we appreciate y'all's time because we couldn't do what we do without you. Um, so you may recognize some of these slides from last Monday during jury selection. Um, and I agree with defense counsel uh, that we we uh, we're not here to really to talk about anything that's in these red boxes. So on on August 8, 2022, John Stephen Meyer in Bear County, uh, and then in count one possess methamphetamine four grams to two hundred grams, and in count two possess morphine one to four grams. I agree. The only thing we're here to talk about is the mental state and possession. I want to talk to you about our burden. Beyond a reasonable doubt is a high burden, and we embrace that burden. Um, but it's not beyond all doubt. Okay, so it's it's if you have a reasonable doubt. So if you have a doubt, it's got to be reasonable. So we're asking you not to leave your your common sense on the courtroom step, courthouse steps. Okay, so don't come in here and and just say, well, reasonable doubt. That's it. That's an impossible burden. Uh, defense counsel gave us this uh, federal burden. That's not the law. 
that federal beyond a reasonable doubt, that's over that's across the street. That's a different courthouse. Beyond a reasonable doubt is what that means to you. And I would submit to you that possible does not always mean reasonable. Okay, so for the mental states, it's either intentionally or it's knowingly. So like we talked about in jury selection, intentionally is I've got the book. I'm going to hit Kevin with this book. I hope it hurts him. That's intentional, okay? Or there's knowingly, aware of the nature of his conduct. And just like we talked about last month, I've got a book. I fall off and I say, I'm going to hit Kevin with this book. I don't say I hope it hurts him, but that's knowingly. And how do we prove mental state? Are we asking you to read, read the defendant's mind? We're not. You can infer mental states from the acts, the words, and the conduct of the accused. So in this case, the defendant makes a statement. And what you see up on that screen there is the defendant. After they, the police read the defendant, his rights, they say, hey, we're about to search the house. Is there anything in the house that's going to hurt us? Is there, are there any booby traps? Are there any weapons in the house? The defendant, John Meyer, makes a statement. There's one small caliber pistol in my room. That helps us get to his mental state. That helps us prove possession. Possession. We talked about in possession. Possession is actual care, custody, control, or management. But we're not trying to prove ownership here. Kevin and I are not trying to, we're, we don't need to produce a receipt or a bill of sale. We're trying to prove possession. And we prove possession to you. We talked about this in jury selection. Constructive possession. You don't have to have something in your hand or in your pocket to, uh, to possess it. And I agree with defense counsel in that uh, we have to prove an affirmative link to prove that, that John Meyer possessed these drugs. And we did that. We did that with his statement. His statement when he says, I've got a small caliber pistol in my room. When police searched the house, they didn't find any other firearms. There was only one firearm that was in the room occupied by the defendant, John Meyer. There's another concept here that we talked about a little bit in jury selection, joint possession. So I, I told you last Monday, uh, Kevin is engaged. And... There's one tube of toothpaste in, in the Kevin and his fiance's bathroom. They both have possession of that. That's joint possession. Y'all might have something similar in your own house, right? One tube of toothpaste, both you and your partner, they both possess that. Okay, so I want to get back to this statement. There's one small caliber pistol in my room. And then when they search the house, the police find this small caliber pistol in the same room that they find the defendant's ID. How do we know it's his ID? Got his name on it. Got his picture on it. Got the address. 224 Majestic Road on it. What else they find in that room? The police find some of the defendant's mail. Got his name on it. Got his address on it. What do they find in that room? They find the morphine. Count two. This morphine. They find that in the same room that they find the small caliber pistol. But the defendant, John Meyer, tells the police, this is in my room. This is what else they find in that room. In the bathroom that connects to that bedroom, they find this blue meth. This methamphetamine right here. I promised y'all last Monday I'd bring y'all some drugs. Here they are, okay? And y'all have the opportunity to examine these closer when you're um, deliberate. But the only way to get into this uh, bathroom where these drugs are found... <laughs> is to go through the bedroom. That's the only way in. You can see that on Deputy Molina's body cam when he walks through the house, when he's searching the house. And you can see that on the photos that we put into evidence. There's only one way into that room. So what are we here to talk about? It's just like me and Kevin were talking about last Monday. We're not here to talk about marijuana. We're here to talk about methamphetamine and morphine. This is poison. These are dangerous drugs in our community. So why should y'all care, right? If the defendant wants to live in squalor and smoke drugs, why do y'all care? We care because of the effect that these substances have on our community. This is in a residential neighborhood, maybe similar to where y'all live. This is uh, 
This is not somebody I, I, I think that you want to live next to, somebody who's smoking meth in their house all day. And we care about these types of cases because of the effect that they have on our community, the attendant crimes that these types of, uh, of activities uh, encourage, and the effect that it has in the ch on the children in our community. This is y'all's opportunity to tell the community that this type of crime should not be tolerated. Y'all are the last link in law enforcement. Thank you for that, Jay. That's the problem. All right. That, uh, the, the, the objection will be sustained. Thank you. Judge, I have a case on this. This is, I'm okay. this is all right. I'll move on. Thank you. Y'all, this case is about responsibility. So who has the responsibility in this case? The defendant, John Stephen Meyer. This is his house. How do we know it's his house? We have the stipulation. We have the ID found in his bedroom. We have the mail. This is his room. How do we know it's his room? The statement he makes to law enforcement. Y'all saw it on video. Y'all will have the opportunity uh, to look at it again when you're back there deliberating. His bathroom. How do we know it's his bathroom? The only way you can get into that bathroom is through the bedroom that he told the police he occupied. It's his gun. How do we know it's his gun? He told the police. Y'all saw that on tape. It's his ID. We just saw a picture of it. His mail. This is his methamphetamine. And this is his morphine. We know what these substances are because Ms. Michelli from the Bear County Crime Lab came in and testified to us. This is uh, morphine, more than four grams or less than 200 grams. I'm sorry. This is meth, methamphetamine, more than four grams, less than 200 grams. And this is the morphine, more than one gram, but less than four grams. You are the exclusive judges of the credibility of the witnesses and of the evidence. So it's up to y'all to decide. But is, this, is this house under construction or is this a meth house? So this picture has been entered into evidence. This is from Deputy Molina's body cam. But if there's a construction project going on, I've circled some things that just don't make sense to me. Uh, in his opening statement, uh, Mr. Stevens said, well, this is a construction house. You got construction house. Well, then you've got construction workers. And so what we've got here in the top right, those are wind chimes. So you've got, you've got a house, uh, part of one of the rooms is down to the studs, and you've got wind chimes hanging there. So is that something that y'all recognize from construction? Or is this something that people who smoke drugs, they're hanging up wind chimes on um, bare beams there? The next thing right below that, those are, uh, looks to me, clean dress shirts. So there's active construction going on. Are you going to hang up your, your laundry on, uh, on hangers in there? That doesn't make any sense to me. And then this, these two items on the left, those are skateboards. So if you're doing active construction in the house, are you going to hang your boards up there? That doesn't make any sense to me. This is from Deputy Molina's body cam. This is that master bathroom. The master bathroom that you can only get to by going through the master bedroom. The master bedroom that's occupied by the defendant. And we know that because of his statement where he says, there's a small caliber pistol in my master bedroom. What I've circled there is a propane torch. And there's a picture of it in evidence. Y'all can take a look at it. And that may have some use in construction. But the other use might be for smoking methamphetamine. And that's what I submit to you, that that's what that uh, torch is for. This is from Molina's body cam as well. And you can see that that, that bed is not made. That's, it looks recently slept into me. And um, I'm not asking you uh, to make any guesses here, but a logical deduction, as defense counsel said, a logical deduction from this is that this was slept in recently by the defendant. This is his room. And we know that because of the statement he made to police about the gun. And this is a picture from that rights video. The defendant has read his rights. And then he says, I've got a small caliber pistol in my bedroom. So Mr. Stevens said in his opening remarks that, uh, you know, there's construction going on and there's construction workers around. That's probably where this drug came from. But uh, is this fella, do, is he doing work? Barefoot? No shirt? Or is he smoking drugs with the defendant? 
I want y'all to remember that in the end, the police were right. So they got some tips that there's narcotics activity going on in a residential neighborhood. And they didn't immediately go and bust the door down. They went out and they, they just took a look. They're doing surveillance. You heard testimony that when they got there, they saw activity that confirmed these tips. Well, something's going on. There's some kind of narcotics activity going on. So then they, they went out again. They did more surveillance. They saw Melissa Yanez leaving the house with a package. Um, when she left the house, she was pulled over for speeding, pulled over for a traffic violation. K-9 did a free air sniff around the car, alerted on the car, indicated to the officers, there's drugs inside this car. That gave them a reason to search the car. They gave them probable cause to search. They searched the car, and they find 300 grams of, of methamphetamine. They got scales in there, and they got pack, packaging, package up the drugs. Um, and they, they found them in a... In a package that looks similar to what they saw her leave 224 Majestic Road with. She's carrying that when she leaves. So then they took those facts to an impartial magistrate and said, ask for a warrant. The magistrate grants a warrant. Uh, and then they went and searched the house. And once, uh, once the defendant was detained, they read him his rights. And they said, before we search the house, is there anything in here that's going to hurt us? And that's when he makes the statement, there's one small caliber pistol in my room. And so I'm not trying to belabor this too much. And you all have the opportunity to look at this when you're back there deliberating. But these are the other items they find in that room that he says, this is my room. They find a small caliber pistol, which, again, is the only firearm they find in the house. Then they find in that same room the defendant's ID. You all have the opportunity to look at that closer. I know it's a little far away. They find his mail. In that same room, they find this morphine. And in the bathroom that's only accessible through this bedroom, they find this methamphetamine. And so I'm asking you to do something hard today. I'm asking you hold the defendant responsible for his actions. I'm asking you to find this defendant guilty of count one, possession of methamphetamine, and guilty of count two, possession of morphine. Thank you. All right, ladies and uh, gentlemen. I'm going to uh, send you back to the jury room, and at that time, you'll choose your per person, and then you may begin your deliberations. Uh, defense and state, if I could see you over here, please. Oh, if I could see you all over here, please.
it's from that. <laughs> Ernest Mora. He's in the back, Judge. All right. So once you have him brought out, we'll take it up. I can just tell you what's going on here. The warrant, not standing warrant on the BWR on the bond increase. Mm -hmm. uh, he's taken into custody. I so didn't have a lot of chance to talk to him, but uh, it hasn't been indicted yet, the BWI. Uh, I talked to with the state about it already. And uh, it, uh, it's interesting because the drug case has been indicted, but not the BWI. But anyway, what I'm asking is if you allow him to be taken into the satellite office, we brought a bond over this morning. We have okay. the process there. All right, let's let's have him brought out. Okay. So just have them bring him out. Okay. When you all get a chance, if you can bring him out. So just give us a moment. Uh, Jose Torres. Who's the attorney for Jose Torres? You are your hand. All right, Mr. Torres. No. no Excuse me. Step back, counsel. Let me move this stuff back to it. I'm sorry. Yes, thank you. Sorry. All right. Did you all already have your jury trial? No, Your Honor. Um, we're still waiting on that, Your Honor. Um, well, you've been waiting for a competency trial since November of 2023. Yes, Your Honor. But um, And the competency was trial was scheduled for January 17th. What happened? It was scheduled, Your Honor. They wanted to. Uh, they wanted to, um, they want before we get due to the trial, they want to get to the medical records, whatever records you might have. So, when did they reschedule this for? Um, they haven't we haven't got a court date, Your Honor. We're, I have to get, I have to get his school records, so I haven't got that yet. All right, could you uh call down to I guess Judge Carruthers Court, see if they have any type of setting on this case? It is uh. 2022 CR11241. So state, I know you're new to this. On this case, there was a plea entered. Then the defense wanted to withdraw the plea. And uh, they're saying there are competency issues. So that's where we are. Yes, April of last year. And Your Honor, um, I think I'll just state there might be additional discovery. I have they have a tender yet. So she's on the conclusion. He's claiming that there's body worn camera that state does not have an evidence. I've sent an email to ask if there is any such evidence. Well, did you all review the there's discovery acknowledgement? Uh, there wasn't anything on the discovery. I was there, Your Honor. Okay. On the on the discovery, I was on the original attorney that was signed to the case, Your Honor. Okay. They don't have a reset date. Yeah, the original date they have is for the seventeenth. All right. So, what medical records are or school records you're supposed to turn over to them? Um, the school record I can't give them honor because I was asked the court. He's he's on he's on GPS, Your Honor. So I talked to the GPS officer, and he told me that. He's not allowed to go to the nursing school, so I have to, I have to get a power attorney. Um, I have to go to his house, get a power attorney, go to the school, and get his records. Yes, that's what I don't understand. Why can't they mail them to him? I could ask the school. If yeah, I mean, just pick up the phone, call the school, tell them you would like your records mailed to you. And what documentation do they need in order to mail you your records or to have someone pick up the records? Yes. yes sir. All right, we're recalling this for February 12th. 
All right, once you sign the reset form, you are excused. Thank you, Your Honor. You're welcome. Uh, Bashan, Jose Torres has been reset for February 12th. Thank you. I like, why do I have this date page for model? Um, defense attorney is asking to approach you on a small question. Just a very quick question. Yes. On model now, the judge is why the judge is me to tell us what I mean. All right, but with the power of attorney, I think you need, and this is just me. Why don't, doesn't that have some part of it has to be notarized or no? No, that's why I'm saying the judge won't let me do it. I said, let me see if I can get the court to bring him over. You hire one of those mobile notary for him to the court. I won't be able to talk to him, but I can do that for you and give you the thing. They won't let her go to the jail and visit him? Okay. So I told him, no, I might get a no, but I'll ask. Yeah. All right, let me talk to the deputies about this. I, and I told her it's going to have to be on the day when the court doesn't have to busy for you or not get it for you. All right, okay, let me see what I can do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but I mean, 30 minutes is only 30. I'm just impressed you've been able to drop that quick payment. Right. To right again. Well, once again, I said he may have been prior to, he might have gotten a lucky break for the first. But, but at this point, it's like the Sussie Bible. Right? How does it get back? You know, it's a full story. It's getting back to the school. I've been in college and party and that's not serious. Okay, we're not thinking. Interesting. It is interesting. I can't look at the book. I'm going to look at the So, yeah. So, it is it's important for you. Know, yeah, okay. Yeah. Make some good arguments that people can sort of lose. Sorry. 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 Um, they're not terrible. They're not terrible. I used to get a little bit better outcome, but it's gotten a little more. How well? It's tricks, but I need to play. Oh, that's a thing, right? It's a problem. 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 They don't want to be, they don't want to kill the goal and then we have switches to it. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. That's why.
I gotta run downstairs. Uh, Mr. Garcia, are you ready on your client? And this is Ernest Mora. I know. Uh, state on Mora. Yes, ma'am. The DWI third. What is the status of that? Defense is saying it has not been indicted. Good. All right. It's uh, 2023-9524. And I'm going to give you a reset, and then they can take you over quickly. Yes, Judge. Yes, to be there by 1115, I was told. All right, so I'm gonna give you a reset for February 26. And once he signs the reset form, you're excused. Uh, yes. Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, is, do, I, do you have a reason why my bond was raised? I don't know why. Uh, they'll have to look in the system. I have no idea. That, that's what, what I feel like it's, it's an error on somebody's part because I've been to court since then and I've complied with everything that they've asked of me. Of All right. Uh, can you look that up and see for me, please? Yeah, the reason I couldn't access to give them the answer is because since there was a warrant out, I couldn't get into the system to get information. Oh, we're going to find out right now. Thank you. It was a bond increase due to a first violation report of non enrollment. All right, and so that was done through Judge Nahara. Yes, so you'll have to talk to Judge Nahara about that. So since you're gonna be downstairs anyway, you can speak to him about that. So I'm not the person who did that, it was Judge Nahara. That was back that's... in November, 2023. Yes. Um, Judge Moore was sitting on the bench that day. All right, Judge Nahara. But and... as I understand it, at this point, the, the warrant cannot be withdrawn because it was already issued. You just have to make the bond, is that correct? Uh, well, you can call the bondsman and see if there's still a possibility of the bond being reinstated. But before you do that, you'll have to see if they will uh, reinstate the bond at its original amount. But if you're on bond for a DWI, you got to make sure if they want you to have ignition interlock, you got to make sure you have that and everything. I mean, all the paperwork, that's what okay. I'm, I'm shocked. Like I've been complaining and all of a sudden, I just, I get this warrant, which- yeah. Well, well, your attorney can talk to Judge Nahara and, and see, because as I said, I'm not the one who did it. Oh, okay. okay. Um, thank you very much. All right. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Judge, that, that helps me. Did say in there that he had it no longer with the office. I just didn't reassign. Okay. All right. And Bashan, uh, Pete Castillo and Abel Rodriguez have been reset for February 8th, defense counsel is out ill. And Jonathan Allen is set for February 5th. And Jose Torres, February 12th, and that's for a competency issue. You blame on the wrong person. I don't know what Dominique Nicholson. Who's the attorney on Dominique Nicholson? Mr. Nicholson? All right. 
So what are we here for today? We had sort of a discovery conference. Mm -hmm. One of the things that uh, came up last time was the possibility that there's some crime lab information outstanding. And we confirmed that there is not. Okay. And then uh, another thing that the state agreed to produce is the criminal history of all the lay witnesses in the case. So they do have some. There's some they still need to get. Okay. But otherwise, I think we'll be in pretty good shape on the discovery. All right. So has an offer been tendered? Yes, Your Honor. It was. It's been a while, but yeah. yeah. All right. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to recall this, and I'm going to recall it for a plea deadline date. Now okay. that everybody is assured that they have everything, okay. and on that date, I'll need the acknowledgement of discovery done. Okay. And sir, how old are you? Six. All right. So I'm going to recall this for February eighth. Is that enough time for everyone? Yes, Judge, for yeah. the deadline date, yes. Okay. Yeah. All right, so we'll be back on February 8th, and that will be your plea deadline date. Do you have any questions about anything? All right, we'll see you then. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And could I see the file on Mary Diaz? For some reason, I think that's not set today. Yeah. Yes, this is set for uh, February 12th. Huh? Yes, Jonathan Allen is set for February 5th. Yes, because that's the mental health issues. Yeah, that's supposed to be on the 12th. Okay. Uh, family violence. Mary Diaz is actually set on February twelfth. Yes. And Patrick Jenkins is, is coming back at 1.30, everyone. Okay. Uh, Deputy Laura, on this one, can you meet us?
All right. So, um, Mr. Grant, you hello. Thank you. Oh, I'm doing great. How are you doing? It's it's great for a Monday. The weather's nice. Yeah. Not too hot. Not too cold. All right. So we can recall him back on February first. You said Thursday. Is that February first? Yes. Then yes. All right. We'll bring you back on February first for potential disposition. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And once you sign the reset form, you are excused. Gonna, you gonna hand me one? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Stay where you are, Robert. I have to reach it. We're playing a two note Oh yes, I am. Here you go. I'll bring it back. All right, thank you. Yes. 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 What? What? Wow. Um, no, just give me the name. Um, one or more. Okay. All right, Ron Rojo, where is he? Come down, please. Are you all ready to proceed on this motion? Why do we need a one week reset? The offers that we have, um, he would like time to think about them. How old are you? I'm sorry. 26. All right. We're going to bring you back at 1.30. Okay. All right. We'll see you all back at 1.30. Yes. You're welcome. Uh, Miss Abrams, Arojo is coming back at 1.30. She should be coming out. <laughs> 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 Michelle Escabel. I think I saw her. All right, thank you. Joshanae Caldwell. Joshanae Caldwell. Who do you have? Uh, Adrian Del Terrio, Judge. You said Del Terrio? Del Terrio. It's all one, all one word. D-E-L-T-I-E-R-R-O. I'm not really sure if I told you it was correct. Yeah. Try calling them. Yeah. That's okay. All right. If you want to go in the back and see if they can pull the file. <laughs> I don't show him as on the docket, but if you have them pull the file, sometimes it doesn't make the docket. Ah, he is on the docket. Just one second. Let me double check one more time.
They have to be worn. Uh, okay. Yes. See if you'll go in the back and have them pull the file because I don't see it on here, the docket. Do you have a uh, Del uh, Yes. Huh? Oh, Yes, they asked me to pull it and then yeah. said, no, don't get it here yet. Oh, oh my girl, girl, I have to make it on my head. And this is going to reset. Okay. This is supposed to be a full. Okay. All right. Are you ready? Yes, sir. Thank you. If you have him come forward. So where are we on the mental health court? Should I, uh, I think the court was concerned about whether or not they would accept him in light of his charges. Um, and so you asked us to look into that. We did email to the uh, Ms. Salazar, who's in charge of that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. She, I just saw an email from Friday where she forwarded it to Bianca, who's going to schedule the screening mm -hmm. to see if they're going to be able to take him or not. So we've, we've made a couple of steps forward. All right. Do you know when the screening is going to I take place? That's as far as they gave me was that she told Ms. Salazar an email that she copied to me. Uh, we'll go ahead and get him scheduled, but without a date. Okay. All right, we'll bring this back on February 12th. Thank you, Mrs. White. You're welcome. So Thank good. you. Have a good one. And Laura, Deputy Laura, we're done with Mr. Del Tirio. Yes. So I guess as soon as he finishes speaking to him. Okay. Yes. Thank you. My plan is advising who wants to hire an attorney. All right. Well, we'll see y'all here at 1 30. You wanted me to ask if you can get a reset button. Oh, yes. If he'll come back at 1 30. All right. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Ramji, in the family custody, 
Renee Esparza. And Suzanne, if you'll speak with Deputy Laura on a date to bring them over, they said they could do that. So she'll be out in a moment. Okay. Court is calling. Could everyone please whisper? Court is calling 2023 CR 10492, State of Texas versus Renee Rodrigo Esparza. Could I have parties announced for the record for the state? Hank Brookins for the state, Your Honor. Defense? Tim Roundtree. Are you Mr. Sparza? Yes, ma'am. Yes, Your Honor. Counsel, have you received all the discovery? Did you review it with your client? I have. Court will find that the state is in compliance with discovery. Mr. Sparza, I'm going to show you what's entitled Application for Community Supervision. Did you review that document with your attorney? Did you understand it? And did you sign it? Yes, Your Honor going to show you what's entitled true bill of indictment. Did you review that with your attorney? Did you understand it? Yes, sir. Counsel, do you waive the reading of the indictment? I do, Your Honor. State, are you proceeding on the indictment as presented? We are, Your Honor. Mr. Sparza, I'm showing you what's entitled court admonishments and defendants waivers and affidavit of admonitions. Did you review that document with your attorney? Did you understand it? Did you sign it in all the appropriate places? Yes, Your Honor. Did you understand your charge while driving while intoxicated third or more? Uh, that's a third degree felony. The range of punishment is anywhere from two to 10 years in prison and up to $10,000 fine. Yes, if you have a plea with the state, the court does not have to follow your plea. If for any reason the court does not follow your plea and gives you more than you bargained for, the fact that you entered a plea will not be used against you and you will be allowed to withdraw your plea. Did you understand? Did you understand you have a right to jury trial, a right for you or your attorney to cross-examine and confront any witnesses, the state would call in the right to remain silent. Yes, Your Honor. Did you understand that today? Did you understand that today by entering this plea, you were giving up those rights? And did you intend to give up those rights and enter into a plea today? Yes. Counsel, has your client been able to provide you with any defenses? He has. Do you believe he has a rational as well as a factual understanding of the charges against him? I do, Your Honor. Do you believe he's currently competent and was legally sane at the time of the offense? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Sparza, has anyone threatened you, coerced you, or placed you in fear to get you to enter the plea? Anyone promised you anything other than the plea? Are you satisfied with the way you've been represented? Yes, sir. Are you a U.S. citizen? Yes, sir. Court will find that defendant has knowingly and voluntarily waived his right to jury trial, showing you the plea bargain page. Did you review that with your attorney? Did you understand it? Yes, sir. According to the plea, punishment is to be assessed at six years in the prison. There's a $2,000 fine. State recommends community supervision. There's to be the DWI intervention course, DWI VIP, driver safety course, regular UAs or an alcohol patch, two years driver's license suspension and ignition interlock for half the term. Did you understand that to be the plea? 
defense? Yes, Your Honor. State? Yes, Your Honor. Showing you the waiver of appeal paragraph. Did you review that paragraph with your attorney? Did you understand it? Did you sign it in both places? Yes, Your Honor. Did you understand by signing that you're waiving your right to appeal the only items that can be appealed are written pretrial motions that have been filed, heard, and ruled upon by the court? Did you understand? Yes, Your Honor. Counsel, are there any such motions? No, Your Honor. Next, I'm showing you outside the plea. State is requesting that your community supervision be for a term of six years. There be a TAP evaluation, 250 hours of community service restitution, GPS in lieu of the 10 days in the Bear County Jail. Did you understand those are recommendations from the state and the court does not have to follow those recommendations? Yes, sir. Then to the offense as charged, how do you plead? Guilty, not guilty, or no contest? Guilty. State any evidence? Your Honor, I offer State's Exhibit 1 and the attachments. Any objections? No, Your Honor. All right, State, you may continue to confer. Thank you. Mr. Spars, I'm showing you what's entitled Waiver and Consent to Stipulation of Testimony and Stipulations. Did you review that document with your attorney? Did you understand it? Did you sign it in all the appropriate places? Yes, Your Honor. Again, did you understand you have a right to jury trial, a right for you or your attorney to cross-examine and confront any witnesses the state would call in the right to remain silent? Yes. Did you understand that today the state will be presenting evidence in the form of witnesses' statements and police reports, but most importantly, there'll be no live testimony. Did you understand? Yes. Court will find that defendant has knowingly and voluntarily waived and submitted and consented to stipulation of testimony and stipulations. Court will accept into evidence states exhibits one and attachments or review the same. All right, after reviewing states exhibits one and attachments, the court will find there's sufficient evidence to find you guilty and the court will find you guilty. Are we proceeding with sentencing? Yes, Your Honor. Anything you wish to say on behalf of your client? Your Honor, I just ask that you would follow the agreement. Uh, Mr. Esparza understands the seriousness of this offense and is committed to sobriety and moving forward, complying with all the terms of probation. And um, I believe he's not going to have any problems. All right. How old are you? Uh, 45, Your Honor. So what type of vehicle was it? Uh, it was a uh, 2020 uh, Lexus. You know, I've heard of people, although it shouldn't be done at all, I've heard of people saying, oh, I want to try out my new car. And maybe it's a Lamborghini. Maybe it's an Aston Martin. But I've never heard of people trying out a Lexus at over 100 miles per hour. I mean, you could have killed a many people. You understand? Yes, Your Honor. So what do you do for a living? Um, I... She appreciate weddings. I have two wedding companies. Me and my wife have built for the past 11 years together. All right. You know that while you're on probation, there's no drinking of alcohol. And based upon your history, you're one of those people who can't just drink one glass and be done. So it's probably best for you in your future, even if you successfully complete this probation, which you should be able to successfully complete it, that you don't drink at all. All right, this is what the court is going to do. Court is going to sentence you to six years in the prison, suspended and probated for six years. There's a $2,000 fine that will be probated. DWI intervention course, DWI education course, DWI victim impact panel live, a driver safety course. random regular UAs, two years driver's license suspension, admission interlock for half the term, proof of employment within 30 days, no employment as a home health care provider or with minors, regular reporting by Zoom or in person, 90 sober meetings in 90 days, tap evaluation out of custody, and do a referral to felony drug court, 
There'll be 250 hours of community service restitution. And he can buy out of those if, if he chooses at $7.25 per hour. Field visits. One time per month for three months. Uh, then at probation's discretion. All right, with regards to the GPS in lieu of the 10 days in Bear County Jail, if you only want to have the GPS for 10 days, then that's full house arrest. That means you will not be allowed to leave your home. So do you want it for the full 10 days? Yes. All right, so there's to be full GPS for 10 days in lieu of the Bear County Jail. Uh, probation, is there anything else he needs? Okay. All right. And with regards to the TAP evaluation, follow the TAP recommendations. Of course, if it recommends inpatient treatment, we'll start with intensive outpatient treatment. Is there anything else you need from the court to be successful? No, Your Honor. All right. I'm going to show you what's entitled trial court certification of defendants' rights to appeal. Did you review that with your attorney? Did you understand it? And did you sign it? All right, because this is a plea bargain agreement, because I followed your plea bargain agreement, and because you waive your right to appeal, you do not have the court's permission to appeal. Because this is a felony conviction, you're not allowed to own or possess any weapons or ammunition. If you have a question over what a weapon or ammunition is, you'll need to speak to an attorney. Do you understand? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Off the record, here's the thing. Usually when people are driving intoxicated, and you going 100 miles per hour, if there would have been an accident, you know what probably would have ended up happening? You were to survive, you would have been just fine. The people who are usually not intoxicated, who are hit by an intoxicated driver, their life is usually changed forever because either they end up dying or either they end up having significant injuries. Don't drink and drive. And I know that nobody ever goes to a restaurant or goes out and says, you know what, let me take some drinks and go out and kill somebody or go out and have an accident. Nobody is anticipating that. I don't know why when people are planning to drink and you know you're going to drink, I don't know why people just don't have a designated driver. I personally don't drink alcohol. I think it tastes nasty. So throughout my education and even now, I'm always a designated driver. It results in me having free soda free lemonade, sometimes a free meal, but people know Stephanie's the designated driver. So be better. Okay. Yes, sir. And thank you for dressing appropriately for court. All right. Have a good day. Okay. George Hawkins. All right. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Where are we on the VA? Still currently receiving services. Judge he has his next appointment uh, in February, um, where they're going to send him up for counseling. Um, in terms of that judge. So we're still, he's still working through his treatment. Um, he's doing well, staying consistent with them. We did receive a plea offer from the state today, judge. Um, they did seemingly take into consideration some of his issues in his treatment and some of the issues with the case. So we're going to speak about his options, your honor, if we may have a plea bargain deadline date. All right. Hey, judge, uh, the state was notified that uh, defense may have to be uh, evaluated by the veterans. 
That's correct as well, Your Honor. We want to see what kind of options are available for Mr. Hawkins. So uh, I'm going to explain to him the veteran treatment court. And if he qualifies, I'm going to refer him to John Herman. So we can... All right. But Sean, is there any way Mr. Herman can come over? Um, yeah, I, I'll, I'll oh, you know. They're going to have him come down now. Okay. All right. And then what we'll do is just approach once he comes down. Because then it'll tell me when to set this. Yes, Your Honor. So just have a seat and he'll come down. Thank you, Your Honor. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Michelle Esquivel. Come forward, Miss Esquivel. Hello. And counsel, you're on this side. All right, Ms. Esquivel, you were late. Why are you really late this morning? Okay. All right. So you're going to have to make plans to catch the bus. Understand? So what are we doing with this case? Uh, I haven't received the e-discovery. As of last night, there was nothing uploaded. Maybe there was a technical issue. I have no idea. Um, hey. And Judge, I just checked with the defense and I showed them that their stuff uploaded. I told them that if that problem persists, that they can bring the hard drive and we will copy the discovery on how to All right. So we're going to recall this. And we're going to recall this for February 12th for discovery. And then on this case, do you want to have her referred to, perhaps to Esperanza Court yes, to see sir. if they would accept her? So if you all would get in touch with Esperanza Court as well. Hello. And I will give you a reset. And Ms. Esquivel, yes. make sure that you're on time. I used to catch the bus as well. And I know sometimes the bus schedule is kind of iffy. So when I had to be downtown for my clients, even though their court time was only at nine, I would always end up at court at 7.30 because that's the bus schedule that would get me here on time for nine. All right, once you sign the reset form, uh, you are excused. You're welcome. Uh, you ready? I'm going to say her name. All right. Carlos Terrazas. Okay. All right. They'll bring him out. George Hawkins. It's the one that we're waiting for. Okay. Thank you. And then after that, we're going to take up this plea. And then uh, after that, any other pleas will come back at 1.30. If you are here to talk to your family member, you'll be asked to step out. All right, anyone who is not on the docket, you need to move to this side of the room. Okay. Yes. Where my client is. Are you doing his plea? Yes, we're going to do his plea, Thank and that's you. the last one. Because I have a two o'clock doctor's okay. okay. All right. <clears throat> Thank you. Can we check when you have a chance the date I gave to Green? Marciano Green? Yes. Oh, thank you. 
All right, so everyone, whoever does not have someone in the box right now, you're coming back at 1.30. Oh, no problem. Uh, Marcelano, Marciano Green, Marciano Green. Court is calling 2023 CR 11441, State of Texas versus Marciano Lyles Green Jr. Could I have parties announced for the record for the state? Daniel Escobar for the state of Texas. Deborah Defense. Stanton Burt for the defendant. All right. And Deputy, could you have them move to that end? Counsel, have you received all the discovery? Did you review it with your client? Yes, sure. Court will find that the state is in compliance with discovery. Mr. Green, I'm showing you what's entitled true bill of indictment. Did you review that with your attorney? Did you understand it? Counsel, do you waive the reading of the indictment? We do. State, are you proceeding on the indictment as presented? Uh, your Honor, we'll be the uh, Any objection? No, Your Honor. All right, I'm gonna show you what's entitled court admonishments. Did you review that with your attorney? Did you understand it? Did you sign it in all the appropriate places? Uh, you're charged with the unauthorized use of a vehicle. That's a state jail felony. Range of punishment is anywhere from 180 days up to two years in the state jail facility and up to a $10,000 fine. Did you understand? You're going to need to speak up. If you have a plea with the state, the court does not have to follow your plea. If for any reason the court does not follow your plea and gives you more than you bargained for, the fact that you entered a plea will not be used against you and you will be allowed to withdraw your plea. Did you understand? Yes. Did you understand you have a right to jury trial, a right for you or your attorney to cross-examine and confront any witnesses the state would call in the rights to remain silent? Yes, sir. Did you understand by entering this plea, you were giving up those rights? Yes. Did you intend to give up those rights and enter into a plea in this case? Yes. Counsel, has your client been able to provide you with any defenses? Yes, Your Honor. Do you believe he has a rational as well as a factual understanding of the charges against him? Yes, Your Honor. Do you believe he's currently competent and was legally sane at the time of the offense? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Green, has anyone threatened you, forced you, or placed you in fear to get you in this to enter this plea? Anyone promised you anything other than the plea? Satisfied with the way you've been represented? Are you a U.S. citizen? Court will find that defendant has knowingly and voluntarily waived his right to jury trial, showing you the plea bargain page. Did you review that with your attorney? Did you understand it? According to the plea, punishment is to be assessed at 14 months in the state jail facility. There are no applications. The state will take in consideration 2024 CR 0731 and county court cause number 716842. And there's to be restitution, if any, to Ian, I-A-N, Glenn, G-L-Y-N-N. -N. Did you understand that to be the plea? Defense? Yes, State? Yes, Showing you the waiver of appeal paragraph. Did you review that with your attorney? Did you understand it? Did you sign it in both places? Did you understand by signing that you're waiving your right to appeal? The only items that can be appealed are written pretrial motions that have been filed, heard, and ruled upon by the court. Did you understand? Yes. Counsel, have there been any such motions? Yes. Then to the offenses charge, how do you plead? Guilty, not guilty, or no contest? State any evidence? State offers state to the one and all attachments. No objection. Showing you what's entitled wavering consent to stipulation of testimony and stipulations. Did you review that with your attorney? Did you understand it? Did you sign it in all the appropriate places? Again, did you understand you have a right to jury trial, a right for you or your attorney to cross-examine and confront any witnesses the state would call in the right to remain silent? Did you understand that today the state will be presenting evidence in the form of witnesses' statements and police reports but most importantly, there will be no live testimony. Did you understand? Court will find that defendant has knowingly and voluntarily waived and consented to stipulation of testimony and stipulations. Court will accept into evidence states exhibits one and attachments. The court has reviewed the same. The court will find there is sufficient evidence to find you guilty and the court will find you guilty. Are you proceeding with sentencing? Yes, please. Anything you wish to say on behalf of your client? No, Your Honor, I just hope you follow our plea agreement. All right, the court will sentence you to 14 months in the state jail facility, give you credit for any time served. 
take in consideration 2024 CR 0731, County Court Cause Number 716842, and there's to be restitution to Ann Glenn. Is there anything else with regards to sentencing? I'm going to show you what's entitled Trial Court Certification of Defendant's Rights to Appeal. Did you review that with your attorney? Did you understand it? Did you sign it? Yes. Because this is a plea, because I followed your plea, and because you waive your right to appeal, you do not have the court's permission to appeal. Because this is a felony conviction, you're not allowed to own or possess any weapons or ammunition. If you have a question over what a weapon or ammunition is, you'll need to speak to an attorney. Do you understand? All right, we can go off the record. How old are you? 52. All right, you're 52. Guess what? You're about to spend 14 months in a state jail facility because of an unauthorized use of a vehicle. And you have to start asking yourself, is it worth it? And if it's not, you're going to have to stop the behavior. Otherwise, you're going to find yourself in and out of somebody's jail and out of somebody's prison. And at some point in time in Texas, when they habitualize you, depending on the felony you have, your minimum is 25 years. You understand? All right. Good luck to you. Be, do better. I told him. All right. Thank you. <laughs> All right. I need this, this file. I don't have it. All right, Jesus Prado, come forward, please. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, you're on this side, Council. Yes. Uh, I'm here for Mr. Garcia, who drew this short stick on being home with the plumber. <laughs> so, um, uh, Mr. Prado has uh, some very serious charges. Yes. We are going to bring this is the first setting. Mm -hmm. We are going to bring, and we discussed with the prosecution, we're going to bring them a hard drive and get all the discovery uh, uploaded onto that so we have everything and then we'll be able to fully go forward from there. All right. So, let me do this. He has. All right, Mr. Gerhan, are you going to be here March 18th? I don't know when the... the Spring break is just a week before that, Judge. I think both birthdays on March 17th. Oh, well, you got to... You got to do I, that? I All right. Well, I'll tell you what, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to set it for March 25th. That's perfect, Judge. And that should give everybody a chance to get the discovery. I know these are some serious cases. So, Mr. Prado, we're going to bring you back on March 25th. If your attorney wants you back sooner than that, then they'll let the court know and we'll put you on the docket. All right. And so March 25th is going to be for discovery. That's to make sure that your attorney has everything they feel they're supposed to have. Do you have any questions about anything? All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so those are done. Jorge Sandoval. Judge, this is Mr. Sandoval, who is also Mr. Garcia's client. Okay. We have actually conferred uh, with the prosecution. We believe we have worked out a deal since it is so close to the noon hour, and I know the court likes to take a timely break. Mm -hmm. uh, we would ask that the court, the case be recalled tomorrow morning. Hank can then do the paperwork, and Mr. Garcia can be here to take the plea. All right. Do you want to do it this afternoon or tomorrow? I'd like to do it tomorrow morning if the court's okay with that. <clears throat> right. We'll recall you for tomorrow. That would be great, Judge. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. And for some reason, it shows your client on bond, but I know he's not. Yeah, um, I saw that also. I'm not sure what's going on there.
All right, Deputy Lord, he's going to come back tomorrow for a plea. Yes. Carlos Terrazas, who's the attorney for that person? Okay. Hello. Hi. So, what is happening with Mr. Terrazas? Uh, went in front of Judge Brothers. Believe that two weeks ago they found him competent, um, but I reasserted my motion to have a sanity review and go with All right. Did they give you a time frame for that? All right. We're going to recall this back on February 20th. All right. And at that time, we'll see where they are on the sanity evaluation. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, everyone, we are taking our noon break. These are the persons who will be coming back at 1.30. From page 23, it'll be Juan Arojo. From page seven, it will be David Garowitz. Uh, Jorge Sandoval is coming back tomorrow. From page eight, it will be Greg Wright. From page nine, Antonio Rios. Joshine Caldwell. Joshine Caldwell. We'll take care of that at 1.30. Patrick Jenkins, 130. Uh, George Hawkins, that necessarily shouldn't be 130, but just give me a moment, counsel. Again, Garowitz, 130. On the next page, Garowitz, 130. So everyone in court will be in recess.